and welcome to this episode of the Futurum Tech webcast interview series. I'm your host, Shelly Kramer. And I am joined once again by my longtime friend, Don Sherman, from the CTO of Pega Systems. Hi, Don. Great hey, to see you. It's always great to chat with you. Always great. And it seems like, you know, every time I turn around, Pega World is coming up again. It, it <laughs> happens so fast. But in advance of the upcoming Pega World Inspire event, which is being held this coming Tuesday, May 4th, from 9 a.m. to 1130 Eastern Daylight Time, I wanted to corral Don. And talk a little bit about what's going on in the industry, what's new and exciting at Pega, what kind of problems you guys are solving for your clients, and just really kind of get a sense pre-event um, of what's going on. So you game for that? Of course. I figured as much. So for starters, let's talk about low code. And its proliferation within the industry as a whole. I know that you and the team at Pega, um, you know, I've been attending the Pega World events in person for probably the last five years. And I remember that your event was the first place I started hearing about low code, no code, that sort of thing. And, and you've had an offering, a low code offering for a long time. But it's yeah. obvious that that's catching on. So what's causing this dramatic shift? Obviously, I mean, it works, right? But, you know, talk to us a little bit about, you know, what's causing this shift and, and why now everyone, whether you're a user or a provider, is interested in low code. Well, I, I think part of it, right, as as enterprises engage in the, the broader need of digital transformation, right? So we just did a big survey of about 1,300 technology leaders, you know, well over half of them are doubling down, for example, on automation efforts as they, they come through the experience of the past year, right? You know, two thirds are doubling down on digital transformation efforts. We can argue that those are potentially all the same thing, but the, the challenge is if you're gonna do all that, and if you're gonna put in place the systems, the application, the automated processes, right? You don't have enough developers to go do all that coding for you. So you've got to broaden the set of people who can join in and help, and help. And you've also got this increasing group of people throughout the enterprise who, for whom technology is not a foreign thing, right. right? The phone is in their pocket. They, you know, maybe they play Minecraft with their kids and they know how to build a world, right, in that. <laughs> so there's this opportunity to provide these people with the technology and to do it in a way that you provide them with the guardrails, the sort of safety measures, that ensure the stuff that they build is sustainable and reusable and secure. But you now broaden the net of who can actually build apps, who can automate processes. We're gonna have um, Deutsche Bahn, uh, the German railway company, talking about how they built this distributed approach to departmental automation by setting up these low code factories in the, the different areas of their business. Oh, that's really exciting. And, you know, the other thing, in addition to a tech savvy workforce, you've got a portion of the workforce that needs reskilling and upskilling. Yeah. And so it's this tremendous opportunity to take people who are smart, who, you know, understand the company, who understand the customers, who understand the goals, and to say, you know what, we're going to add this capability to your job skill set. And when you have a chance, I know I've had a chance to talk with some of those people in the past. And when you see their eyes light up about how their job function has changed and what they feel like they're able to contribute in. And, you know, you hear them say things like, you know, I never thought I could like write code before. And that just seems so fancy. And, you know, here I am building automations. And it's like, that's, that's a game changer. It's a life changer. And I think that enterprises are, are very much focused on reskilling and upskilling. So I think that that's an important component too. And when you can, you know, when you can have this tech savvy group of users who've literally grown up with, you know, these things in their hands, right? And who really understand technology and, and we can all work together within the workplace. I think that's exciting and important. Well, it, and, and beyond the reskilling, right? And the opportunities that this creates is huge. Right. And at the same time, it's the right thing for the business, right? Because right? what you're doing is you're actually bringing the users, the stakeholders directly into the conversation. So these are the people who actually know the systems they're using today. They know where the pain points are. They know where the process is broken. They know where they have to do all kinds of manual effort in order to right. fulfill a customer need. Right. So now you empower them with the tools to fix that, to make it better, 
it, you're you're not only empowering and skilling up a set of people, you're empowering the people on the ground who actually know where the problems are to go right. solve them themselves. And that's a huge, you know, a huge potential for organizations. Absolutely. And, you know, that reminds me, we did um, a joint research project together um, that came out last year. And uh, one of the things that we found was that um, employees throughout the organization, um, and, and let me back up and say what I thought was really cool about this research is that instead of only surveying senior executives and C-suite leaders, we talk to people throughout the organization in this survey, and that happens very rarely. <laughs> and what we, what our research found, what our, what our respondents told us is that they wanted to be involved in digital transformation. They just didn't know how, and they weren't being asked. They weren't being tapped and they felt like they could bring, you know, solutions and they could bring, you know, like you were saying, the real world understanding of, of what's needed and how to get there and how to best serve customers and how to best fine tune their own processes or jobs or whatever. So it, it totally makes sense. It really does make sense. Well, and, and, I, and I think the other thing that's really important, you, you we talk about this sort of transformation. I, I, I think it's also important that organizations think about the full spectrum of what you can do with low code, right? Because you can use it for ta tactical things, right? Small departmental things. And, and that allows one motion. You kind of get these, what we call an app factory going of these citizen developers, right. a, a nice set of guardrails that ensure the stuff that they do is sustainable and just kind of let them go and build what they need. But I think low code also allows for this collaborative approach to much bigger transformational or sort of core processes in the business where this isn't necessarily about taking IT completely out of the equation. Right. It's actually about bringing IT and business together in a room and doing a design thinking session and having everybody put hands on keyboards and start to prototype what the the next version of a process is going to look like or the next version of a customer service experience is going to look like. And you can you can take this low code approach and apply it both to these more departmental, more tactical things, but also to even some of the biggest transformations that you do in your business. Well, and we talk about digital transformation a lot, certainly around here. And, you know, one of the things that we know that's key to success with transformation is creating a culture a culture of innovation, a culture of continuous learning, a culture of embracing change and being excited about that. And so I think that's all part of the equation. And, you know, I mean, we've long talked about the fact that silos aren't the answer. And you're right. This isn't just IT's job. And so when we quit treating automation and these kind of things, like this is just IT's job, I'm going to go over here and focus on what I'm, is I'm doing. I think are, are the results that we're going to get as a result are going to be exponentially greater. And I think that's exciting. It, it certainly is. So tell me more, a little bit more about Pega's offering in the low code space. So, you know, we've had um, a, a, an offering that has for years been what we used to call before the low code was even a term. We used to talk about it being model driven or visual driven, right? So if I want to build a business process, I don't need to code the business process. I draw the business process and our system under the covers writes the code for you. It actually generates the app that runs the business process and has your user screens and all of that. So that offering, our core PEGA platform, has a design environment we call App Studio. And that's really designed to allow both business and IT users to come in and define the core elements of an application, especially an application that automates a process. Right. And as we've worked through clients deploying this, and as we've worked through um, the process to make this successful, we, we've learned a couple of things. And we've tried to actually bake that into the technology, in, into the methodology. And the, the first is you've got to take a design thinking approach, right? The, the, um, the one thing you, you generally don't want to do, especially if you're thinking about your transformation or driving change, is you don't want to use low code simply to repave the cow path, right? You don't want to just rebuild your existing thing. So how do I look at my process in a way that helps me redesign it? And so we very much guide you through thinking about your process as a series of high level stages and steps. And that allows you to step back and look often from an employee or even a customer perspective at how they experience that process and right. what the outcome they're trying to get to is. Right. And that's that's essential to a design thinking approach that's very outcome focused, very problem focused. 
And once you nail down that process, what we often call a micro journey, a chunk of a process, right. the next two pieces mm -hmm. to think about for that app are who, who are the personas, who are the people who are going to interact with that app and how, where are they going to interact with? Are they going to use a mobile app? Are they going to, you know, come in through a portal? Do, do they need to send an email and just get an update back? So capturing that and then finally capturing what's the data that feeds it, right? And where does that data live? Does it live in a cloud service someplace? Or for a lot of our customers, that data still lives in a legacy database someplace or God forbid on a mainframe. So we're going to provide the tools to pull that in. And if you can get the micro journey, the personas, the data and the interfaces you need captured, you've gone a long way to actually building yourself an app that can automate a process. So, And, and it makes sense, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, I mean, really having a, 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 the customer journey in mind every step of the way, Jeff Nicholson and I talked a lot about that in an interview yeah. that I did the other day. And, you know, I mean, it makes a huge difference. So talk to me a little bit about then how is this, okay, so you've kind of been a pioneer in the low code space, um, you know, no stranger to it. You keep fine tuning that and all of that. But how's this impacting Pega's business? So I think it's been, uh, it's been a huge impact on our business, both in terms of the way we engage with our clients and the kinds of problems we solve, right? And I think, I think what's, what's, what's really important is I mentioned earlier that idea of that spectrum right of how do i start with something that might be relatively small and tactical right but then use that success to iterate up to something that is much larger and transformational so you you're going to hear uh at pega world stories of clients who have been able to start pretty small and then grow this into something pretty substantial you're going to hear for example from pfizer who is using this process automation technology to change the way that they roll out their testing for new drugs and new vaccines that they release, right? Which is, I think, something timely, timely, right? Something that we're all sort of we're all, we're, we're all sort of thinking about, right? Um, you're going to hear from Mondelez, who is the the brand behind uh, uh, a lot of the sort of snack foods that we all we all, all, the, all, ju all the junk food I eat, all, all the all, all the all the junk food that we love, right? But around how how they are actually using this to stitch together all of the different pieces of their pretty complicated supply chain, but to make that a complete experience for their suppliers and employees, right? So this low code approach, I think has allowed us both to address the needs of more clients, but also really support that broad spectrum. Because you know the thing that we found is once you've automated one process or solved one micro journey for a client, there's 30 more that we can go help them with. And right. uh, and that's a great opportunity for our clients. And frankly, that's also a great opportunity for us as a software vendor. Absolutely. I think that, you know, my experience with anything that involves change, and of course, digital transformation is all about change. Um, and whether it, you sell what you're selling or anything else, it's that, you know, when you can find these use case opportunities and you can go, you know what? we can fix this, you know, yeah. we can, we can do this. And then, you know, you have, a, you have a use case and, and then you have 10 use cases and then, you know, it starts to snowball and people start looking around and even doubters, right. Start looking around and going, wait a minute, look at all they have going on over there in this XYZ department and look how amazing <laughs> this is working. I want a piece of that right now. And then that's really when you see people adopt at a much rapid, more, much more rapid pace. And that's when it becomes really exciting. Yeah. And, and, and we're seeing, frankly, the same thing on um, the partner side, right? So yeah. We're going to be talking, um, you know, specifically about some of our our partner program stuff at Pega World, and and I think the partners that we work with, they see the huge implication of this technology for their clients and their ability to right. work with their clients to continue to roll out, you know, faster and and broader, um, broader change across those organizations. I, I think the other thing, you know, we we're technologists. I'm a CTO, so I tend to talk a lot about technology, and I think technology is really important. Um, you're putting together that digital platform, the automation. You know, we just released some new capability that we call Process AI. That's all about applying AI capability to automation, so to make your processes smarter and, and almost self-optimizing. But along with that, you actually have to get the digital skills right. And you know, you talked about how change is so hard. Change to me is a digital skill. 
It's a it skill is. that an organization needs to grow. It's a skill that organizations need to sort of uh, train into their people, that fluidity, that right. comfort with sort of iteration. And I think one of the, the positive things that's come out of the last year is I've seen a lot of organizations really learn what agile truly means, right. right? When you put the pressure of urgency behind things, right? Traditional project approaches go out the window and you then just start trying things and iterating. Right. You roll out an app in five days because you don't have a choice but to roll it out in five days. And wow, we can do that. Isn't yeah. that great? And by the way, if there's stuff that we missed, awesome. We can we'll get, get it. it. We'll, 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 get, we'll get it the next time. Or we may learn we never really right. even needed it that much to begin right. with. But that that breaking through that sort of fear of beginning to move fast and fail early so that you can learn, you know, I, hopefully we can continue a little bit of the, the energy of that urgency, um, you know, as, as hopefully, you know, we, we move on to whatever the, the after looks like, although, yeah. you know, I, I hopefully all of us are going to continue to stay healthy. I know a lot of our partners and colleagues and clients in India are are still uh, still scary sort of, times. Scary yeah. times, but I hope they all stay safe. But but I do think there is, I do think we can continue to drive that sort of agility into the business. You know, I think that uh, I've been telling people for at least the last decade, when I'm talking with anybody about joining our team, one of the first things that I say is, if you don't love change, you will hate working for me. You no. will hate working with our organization because everything we do is focused on change. And I realize, you know, I'm very respectful of the fact that change is scary. Change is scary for the enterprise. Change is scary for individuals. And I think that that's what startups, generally speaking, have done so well is, you know, in many instances, a startup has an idea and launches. And, you know, before you know it, they pivot and they're doing something completely different. And, and so really understanding that failure is not a bad thing, failing fast, tweaking, changing, being agile. I mean, those are all really, really good things. And, and so I think that, as you said, it's as exciting to feel like the enterprise is learning that and that it isn't such a scary thing. And I think that's going to be good for everybody. And, and you know, the reality of our world is, you know, you and I are immersed in the technology space. So, you know, we're each beating the same drum. But the reality of it is the pace of technological change is not going to slow down. No, it's not. It, is, <laughs> it is only going to speed up. That, that's right. And, and you know, you, you talked earlier about, you know, the, the power of low code to help people with reskilling, Right. right? Right. That to me is a form of this kind of change right. of and, and, and I think the the career paths of the future will be far more fluid. You know, you will be uh, a frontline business operations person and then maybe you'll grab some low code skills and maybe for a while you'll drive a low code agile team that's deploying an app. And then you'll be responsible for driving the continuing ongoing uh, nature of that app. And then maybe you'll pick up some in process improvement skills and do uh, like, but that fluidity of I'm constantly learning new things, right? And I'm constantly, my role is constantly evolving as both the needs of the company and what the technology enables change. I, I think that's something, you know, just from a career perspective that we all need to, to grow increasingly comfortable with, because I, I think it's the world that we're going to be living in. And by the way, isn't that a much more interesting, fulfilling, challenging career yeah. than the alternative? You know what I'm saying? Like just why in, you know, I, tr I talk to my kids, I have 15 year old twins that are freshmen in high school. And so we're having, you know, career future talks in the early stages. And, you know, one of the things that I'm making sure that I tell them is, you know, think about the, like, you want to get up every day doing something you love, you know, that you absolutely can't wait to get started on because you're going to spend, you know, your lifetime working. And it's kind of a hard concept when you're 15 to understand that. But I do think that that is, you know, really doing things and, and that allow you to learn and grow and, you know, continuous learning. Like I'm such a geek, you know, if I could just sit, if I had a job that just allowed me to sit all day and learn new stuff, I would never be happier. Unfortunately, um, you know, I have clients that want my attention and things like that. But anyway, I think you're absolutely spot on. So let's talk just quickly about industries that might be more apt to be drawn to low code. What are you seeing? Yeah. So, so a couple of places where we're seeing a lot, I mean, financial services, 
Uh, we're seeing a lot of growth in the low code space there. Yeah. Again, very process centric business, right? Lots of very customer focused processes, whether you're talking about onboarding new customers, doing servicing, uh, supporting change. So we see, we see a lot there. Um, healthcare is a place, again, a lot of change right now in that industry as we think about, you know, what does it look like to serve our healthcare members in a different way to take a much more holistic view of their experience. Um, so we see a lot driving there. Even government, you know, like, you know, we, w- what's interesting is, you know, we we were able to work, for example, with the U.S. Census, and they use the same low code platform that Deutsche Bahn is using to roll out departmental things. They use the same low code platform to capture the hundreds of millions of census responses that we just completed. Right. So so and everybody's got this need to move fast to respond to think differently. So I think any any industry that's seeing rapid change and for our technology, any industry that really needs to think about not just their their apps, but the processes that those apps drive and ultimately automate that that's good candidates for 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 this technology. Well, and I think too, you know, some of the some of the success stories are so fascinating. Um, you know, where we're seeing that, you know, processes that used to take two weeks from inception to completion can be done sometimes in a matter of hours. I mean, yeah. it's amazing. And so when you think about that, you know, and I know in the early days of the pandemic you and I talked and I talked with several other members of the PEGA team, um, you know, about use cases then. And, you know, it was a time when there was much stress on the part of, you know, companies and on the part of consumers and people needed, you know, people needed fast results from financial institutions or fast information from healthcare institutions. And so, you know, being able to use low code solutions and being able to use automation to solve those problems quickly made a huge difference. So I think that, you know, that's really where it's exciting because what that translates to is happier customers, happier employers, and a very definitive impact on the bottom line in terms of costs, you know? Well, well, and and what I love about automation, especially right now, is it's this, you have this really powerful double benefit, right? Automation has always been about efficiency, right? So can I do things cheaper? Can I remove costs? But I think people are also really realizing that automation is about simplification. Automation is about making things easier, right? Making it easier for your employee to get something done, making it easier for your customers to get to the outcome that they want. Right. And you have that that dual benefit of I'm making it more efficient for my business, but I'm making it easier for my customer. So it's a better experience for them. Right. So I'm doing the right thing for the customer and the right thing for my business. And and taking that end to end view of a process, especially from a customer's point of view and using low code and automation technology to make it better. I mean, that's that, that that's a win win for every stakeholder. Absolutely. You know, and I'm sensing a theme that I am going to see at Pega World, which is all about doing the right thing for the customer. Yep. And and you know what? Nobody told me that. I'm just going to say that I had a conversation with Jeff Nicholson and I'm having a conversation with you and that phrase has come up. So I'm going to be looking forward to hearing more about that. And as we wrap up our conversation, Don, just tell me, is there something, you know, tell me what you think the most interesting thing um, for people to look out for um, with regard to the upcoming Pega World Inspire event. And by the way, again, that event is this coming Tuesday, May 4th from 9 to 1130 Eastern Time. Tuesday, May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. It's the Star Wars Pega World. <laughs> but um, but the, so, so I think there are two things that I'm really looking forward to. One, first and foremost, our clients take center stage at Pega World. So you're going to get to hear from, I mentioned Pfizer, Deutsche Bahn, Wells Fargo, this wonderful British charity called Step Change. Um, so just great real lessons from the front of how people are, are using technology to make things better for customers. Right. I'm also really looking forward to, I'm, I'm running a session at the tail end of Pega World where we're going to kind of look ahead into the future. And we're going to look at some things like hyper automation and AI governance and extended reality and have an interactive conversation about what these technologies really can mean to the enterprise in terms of business value. So I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to sort of looking ahead, but connecting some of those dots for people. Oh, I think that's really going to be exciting. And I will make sure and attend that event as well at the end of Beggar World. So with that, 
to our audience. Thank you for hanging out with us today. Don, it's always a pleasure. And I'm looking forward to Tuesday. Excellent. We'll see you there. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>